Hi, my name is Brady Bissett. I'm a photographer, filmmaker, cinematographer, and this is my cinematography breakdown of a spec commercial I shot for Citizen Cider. With a mission to make the best cider, east and west of Champlain, we at Citizen Cider pride ourselves on fermenting fresh, local apples and tops, never from any concentrate. Because we don't do it the easy way, we do it the better way. And that's how you make cider for the people. So now that you've seen the commercial, I want to start by getting into what exactly a spec commercial is. So essentially, a spec commercial is a portfolio piece, something you want to show to future clients, something that might be a passion project that kind of fits into your realm, your field, your industry of photography or film that you want to be pursuing in the future. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have or have not worked directly with that client that you choose. In this case, I chose Citizen Cider, but it really shows your viewers what you can do and what you have to offer. One of the benefits of a spec commercial actually are that it's left to your own creative style. There's no kind of higher end watching over you, nobody watching over your shoulder with a strict budget or requirements of what the final product needs to look like. You're left to your entire creativity. So a few reasons why I chose Citizen as my brand to work with in the spec commercial is that I'm just genuinely a fan of the product. I love everything that they have out. Everything tastes phenomenal. But additionally, I, I kind of planned out, I didn't want a brand that's extremely big like Bud Light or Budweiser that there's no chance of anybody seeing it. But I also want a brand that's large enough that if it gets seen, there's potential for future work. So I figured Citizen is kind of right in that middle ground. So they might actually see it. And at this point, they did recognize it. Who knows what's going to come of it. Do a project that, or do a brand that you're passionate about, something that you're going to be able to get creative with and make a cool, cool final, um, final product with. So with that being said, let's dive into the scene breakdown. There were three main components that go into everything that you see in the scene. You've got the mason jar, you've got the wood, and you've got the apples. Obviously, you've got the citizen cider because there's no point of doing a product video without the product in it. Set that aside. The cider was founded in Vermont and still is based out of Vermont. So to stress that kind of Vermont rustic in the woods, whatever feel, I thought wood immediately. And it's what I had on hand. So if you're on a low budget, take what you got on hand. After that, I got mason jars. Mason jars are always a really homey atmosphere, homey environment type of thing to have. So I figured why not pour the beer in that? You can get cool reflections off the writing as well. So it was a perfect, perfect scenario. Third one is apples because it's cider. Oh, we also had the tin can thing. Whatever that tub was, that metal tub, it just fit. There's no reason for it. I was going to put ice in it, and then I didn't, but it looked cool. It added more to that woodsy, Vermont, outdoorsy feel. So that's why it's there. Um, but going into how everything was laid down, I strategically placed all the products. I didn't just have every beer in a line. I wanted it to look like it was randomly set there, but like perfectly randomly set there. Like a messy bun. Girls try so hard to make it look like they don't try at all. And I've done it time and time and time again in all of my shoots where I need like the perfect, imperfect messy bun. Makes sense, right? Translating hair to this scene, I strategically placed each beer can, each apple, each block of wood to fill the frame evenly, fill negative space. So in this frame, I've got in this bottom corner the apple just thrown in the background. It's because I had negative space and everything just kind of fell off into nothingness. And I wanted to add more depth to everything. So I threw in that apple. Same with the block of wood that's in there. That's the thought that I had going into it. I just wanted to make it look like it was set, set down at a party, set down at a get together, whatever it is, and left there just to look really aesthetic and really cool. Just a little punch better. Gear. The gear that I used on this was my EOS R because Canon has yet to send me a C200. And I need that, so thank you. Uh, no, but I used my EOS R and I had it connected to my Atomos Ninja V just so I can record 4K ProRes in 10-bit because it's a lot better that way. And I'm picky and I pixel peep and I just am extra like that. So here we are. Shot with the R with the Atomos. 4K, 24, and 30. I bounce back and forth between. We'll get to that in a little bit. 
but I used a Sigma 18 to 35 1.8 because with the crop at 1.7, it kind of brings everything back and it's just like the best lens known to me. I love it. It's a perfect lens. So on that 18 to 35, I had my black Promist 1.8 filter and I had that on there just to soften all the highlights, soften the reflections, make everything look really angelic or heaven-like or heavenly or whatever because I kind of wanted to reflect positivity on the product. I wanted everything to be really bright, angelic, really cool. So I was like, let's slap a Promus filter on there. It'll look great. Um, I bounced back and forth. Like I said, I bounced back and forth between 24 frames and 30 frames a second. I always hate, 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 hate filming at 30 frames a second. It just looks weird and sticky. But my reasoning with that was the twinkle lights that I had in the background, they were LED or whatever the ones that flicker, they were those. So normally you just bounce back and forth between 1 40th and 1 60th of a second, but they were flickering the whole time through and through. So I noticed that when I moved it to 30 frames a second, set my shutter speed to 60th of a second, everything went away. And it got me a little bit of slow-mo that I can't get on the EOS R anyway in 4K. I did have it locked off on a tripod this whole time. I don't normally like doing that, but I didn't have a slider. I didn't really want to use my Ronin. It started with my first shot being a tripod shot and I used that all the way through and it worked great. So I like the look of it. So tripod is one other thing that I used in my gear. Now moving forward with the gear, we can move over to lighting. My key light is what I've got here, the Aperture 120 D Mark II. I love it. It's a fantastic light and I had that with the Aperture softbox overhead and the grid. And I had the grid on it just so I didn't have any light spill going into the kitchen, into the rest of the house because I was working on a coronavirus quarantine. So I can't leave the house. So that's what I had to, had to work with. So 120D with the dome, with the grid, keeps all the light kind of isolated there, prominent dead center over the, over the, over the beer. I also had the 120D placed kind of how I have this one placed here, kind of at a 45, 45 degree angle. I didn't want it completely overhead, but I didn't want it completely on the side. So I settled with that being the best, the best location for it. So after the 120D being the key light, I had two little mini 20Ds or whatever they are coming from each corner. The first one on frame right was mainly just to accent that reflection of the water droplets on the right side of that main can and also have a little spotlight light hit, sun flare hit just because I like them and it added a little bit of texture to the background and a little bit of character because that's my style if you want to call it that. Also I had a one tucked over way on frame left. That one was tucked behind a diffuser, a little silk because bouncing off of the rest of the cans as well as that metal jug, it was a little bit hot of a reflection. So I just softened it with a little five in one, I don't have it, one of the little five in one diffuser discs. The important thing with rim lights are they separate subjects, whatever it is, beer, people, a toothbrush, whatever it is that you're shooting, they separate that from the background, um, especially if it's a black toothbrush and a black background, you're gonna get a little bit of brightness so you can see that silhouette lining, that edge lining. And that's the beauty of rim lights. That's why I had that three point light set up. So I had those twinkle lights in the background for two different reasons. One, it adds depth to the frame. It keeps the eye going forward. The first thing that they see is the apple and stick in the foreground, bringing them into the main subject there, the beer and the apples and everything in that main setting, following it back out. You get the apples trailing all the way back to the, all the way back to the twinkle lights. And my method behind that is the thirds rule, not like the grid thirds rule, I call it this, but having depth to the image. So you have a foreground, you have a middle ground, you have a background. If you're taking a portrait outside, you've got maybe brush or trees in the foreground, you've got the person sharp in focus, and then you've got mountains in the background or clouds if it's a cloudy day, following that thirds rule and making leading lines all through the frame. So the other reason I have the twinkle lights is to add to that homey outdoorsy feeling. I want to make it look like it's a gathering outdoors, some kind of social event to add to contrast with the wood, the apples, the twinkle lights make it feel like it's outside. We've got the gear down, we've got the lighting down, we've got the setting down, you know what a spec commercial is, but there's always little special tricks in Hollywood or wherever you're shooting because film isn't real. And I'm gonna share these special tricks with you and first of all, condensation. That's the key, you want these drinks to look frosty, cold, like you just pulled them out of a snowbank. But things take time. How long did this take, shooting? Four to five hours. Like four to five hours felt like eight. 
those drinks aren't gonna stay cold. Typically what a lot of people do is they'll mix water with glycerin, put it in a spray bottle and spray it onto the cans. Instead, I, I, I did some research and found out that Kiro syrup or corn syrup mixed with water kind of does the trick as well. But I didn't think that it was gonna beat up nicely like it does on cold cans. So I went to my, my garage and I grabbed some car wax. So after that, I mixed up that Kiro syrup, I mixed up that water, sprayed it on, checked it like four hours later and the beads were still on like it just got pulled out of a snowbank. Refreshing is the word. It's what makes drinks refreshing and appealing to the viewer. And that's what you want. You want to make sales based off of that. Um, going kind of into the post end of things, the lights that were flickering pissed me off and made me mad. And I had already gotten a shot and I didn't notice until after the shot and after I had moved on and moved forward. So another trick that I did, if you have those little fluorescent lights that are flickering, I masked out the can a little bit and took the lights and just took a frame hold of the lights. So they didn't flicker at all. They just stood there and nobody could tell. With everything laid out on the table for you, it pretty much sums up my entire breakdown for that spec commercial I did. I hope it was helpful for you guys. If it was helpful, if you want more of them, please share it, please like it, because not a lot of you are probably watching this, but make people watch it. And if you want me to do more, let me know. Tell me, give me suggestions, whatever. I'll do what you guys want to do. But until the next one comes out, thank you again. Like, share, subscribe, as every YouTuber would say. And I'll see you next time.